welcome to the Metal Voice once again. Alan, who do we have? The unbelievable Michael <laughs> Kiske, a return guest. We always love having Michael on. He's a dread gentleman, and it's always a pleasure to speak to you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you for um, inviting me to this interview. Okay. South America, Halloween is going, Pumpkins United going to South America, April 15th to April 30th. I think there's some festival dates there. Then they're coming oh, back to the United States and North America from yeah. May 5th to June the 3rd. But this yeah, time... Yeah, there's a lot of jumping. There's a lot of jumping uh, between the time zones, which is, which is going to make that very tough. I mean, we, we jumped on that tour with KISS, because they just asked us if you wanted to be part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't the plan at first, but uh, since when you play with Kiss, you, you play like big places with a lot of people that maybe didn't know you before, so you just do it, you know? Uh, um, but then after the the, the, the the short Kiss thing, we will be like for two freaking shows, we, we will be coming back to Germany. And I think oh. about five, five days later, we fly back to, to North America. <laughs> So it's, it's going to be a jet lag as fuck. I'm sorry. How does that affect the voice? How does that affect the voice jumping around like that? Older I get, uh, the more the voice gets a bitch. I mean, it functions, but it is a bitch. It wants sleep. You know, you, you need some good air. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm. I, it wasn't like when you're a teenager, nothing matters. You know, <laughs> you can you can do whatever you want. You don't need sleep. You don't need to eat. The voices there. The older you get, the more you got to take care of it. It's just the way it is. You know. So okay, last time we spoke, you told us about the reunion, how it happened, how it all came together, how you all worked together, you and Andy, and the whole band is one happy German family. Okay, yeah. well we're past that now. We're at round two for North America. And yeah, we're past that. Course. We hate each other now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so no, no, I know you're kidding. Sorry, Sorry so, I wasn't interrupting you. No, no. Um, okay. How is now? There's a new album. You haven't played the new album. You're playing sort of the hits. How is the set list going to be different this time around versus when you came back a few years ago? And of course, it was postponing. But a few years ago, you were in Montreal in North America. How's that three-hour set list going to be different? Then what could people expect in the set list? How's that this time? It's going to be different in, in, in two ways. Um, first of all, because coming out of this pandemic situation, mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of the bands uh, were thinking about, you know, when you, when you start touring again, um, nobody knew how the audience would uh, come to the shows and stuff like that. So there was this, this element of insecurity. Without the pandemic, we would have done another three hours show. Okay. But since the situation has been the way it has, we just decided to team up with uh, with Hammerfall, just in case, you know, like some sort of a safety net. And Good. it turns out great. It works. People show up. Uh, and it works so great that we even continue to do this, even though the, the fear that we had of, you know, not, not enough people might show up or something like that has not really come true. People do show up. Thank God. But we continue because it works great. So because we're not on our own, the set will be shorter. So we 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 not we will not be playing three hours. It'll be a little bit over two hours uh, because it would be too long, you know, with an, with another act. And um, and in addition to that, of course, we will be playing some new songs. So it's not going to be like it was uh, in 2017, 18, 19, where we basically you know, shut down the hits, uh, shut out the hits. You know that you can do it. it it'll be. A few hits, but also a couple of new songs. You know, it's gonna be it's gonna be different, and it's not going to be three hours. And we actually extended on that. It was very often three and a half hours and stuff like that, depending on how much we were goofing around on stage. <laughs> and, uh, no more, no more uh, pre pre show hi uh, hijinks. Everybody's older and more docile, and and with with uh, with Kiss, of course, we I think we play. 70 minutes or something like that so it's oh, going to be even more a tight set but i don't know the set hasn't been decided yet on the on this festival tour uh, but i i guess it makes sense because it's all about you know maybe attracting some some new people so we would probably on that one we shoot out mainly the hits you know that's what i would do you know because it's just go in bang it and go out again when you do a headline show you can do whatever you want in the end but yeah. on a show like that most people will be coming for kiss and then 
maybe the next uh, load of people will be coming for the purple and, and you know down the down the line and pr probably just a few are going to show up for us so it's good to make uh, a strong impression with some of the best songs we have you know very smart yes i agree uh it's been a while since this album was released now right right the last one I, yeah. I, i'm assuming i'm assuming there's you know, you guys must be bouncing ideas off each other, thinking about the next album. You know, I'm sure there's some downtime now a bit. Uh, oh, yeah. Actually, like uh, 10 days ago or maybe a week ago, um, Kai actually has sent me uh, a demo of a song that he was doing that I was very happy about because it's not what you would expect. It's, it's a bit, it's a bit, uh, the song is a, was a bit outside of the box, which I am always uh, grateful for. You know, I, I always thought that was uh, exciting about Halloween. You know, when you when you when you check out the Keeper One and Keeper mm -hmm. Two record, now they're classics. But when they came out, it was very different to to what the Walls of Jericho record sounded yes. like. But we had the balls to do it, and I think that's that's why I'm still here because those records had an impact because of being pretty fearless. You know, and and it is always uh, the benefit of the youth that you that you most of the time the the younger people are very fearless, and that song. And this is what I what I like about Waikiki and Kai. They they can't fool themselves. They just write songs. They they don't function in in any other way but just making a song and whatever it is. That's what it is. And that song was a bit Queen like. It had a lot of piano parts in it, very operatic with big choirs. And then it gets rocking again and stuff like that. It's another Kai Hansen sort of symphony. But I really liked it, and I um, I'm glad that he does something like that. I just hope hope the rest of the band has the balls to do it. You know? I would do it. <laughs> do, is the rest of the band writing? That's my question. Are they all writing? Yeah, I, I don't know gonna... about the others. I know, I know that uh, I think Andy has some stuff. What about you? Uh, are you gonna Are you gonna toss in some ideas this time around? I don't know. I'm not so much of a metal songwriter. I, I was when I was a teenager, but these days I just don't write metal songs. I just write songs on acoustic guitar somehow. And if I if I have something where I feel the band could make a Halloween song out of it, of course I will, you know, present it to them. And then if if they get a kick out of it, something's gonna happen. But we have so many songwriters in this band now, and they're all really capable of 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 writing that sort of material that everybody loves. And that's mainly Andy, Sasha, Waikiki, and Hanson. And I think I think that's more than enough. You know, if I have an idea, I sneak it in, but I don't really push myself you know and i cut you off before you were saying about the rest of the band exchanging ideas and such yeah, yeah i know that andy has songs and i know that kai has has, has a whole bunch of songs i um, mean he was a bit lazy last time he only had that one great song skyfall which is great good song, for three yeah. songs it's maybe good for three songs and that's why it's justified but i would have wished for even more from him you know and i think this time he will be presenting a whole bunch of songs more. At least that's my impression, the feeling that I have. There might be more coming from him this time. And Andy is always in the game. Andy has this gift. He can just sit down and write 10 songs. He can just do it. <laughs> I don't know how he does it. <laughs> well, and what's the demographic when you look out there? You know, you were saying that you're hopefully fans will come to see you as well. I, I, I thought that was a foregone conclusion, but, you know, maybe, maybe not. Maybe it's just the guys losing their hair like Jimmy and I that are showing up. I, I hope that's not the case. I'm hoping a whole other generation's uh, discovering the, the the genius of Halloween, but just want to get your... Like it. it looks like it. I mean, when you when you watch from the stage, you, you, you usually see the young ones because the young ones are always like first row. Same yeah. with me. When I was a teenager, when I was Same. at the maiden shows, I wasn't first row. Now I'm in the back. <laughs> yeah. Where's, where's the seat? Yeah, exactly. It's like our generation, <laughs> they're more like in the back. But it, and so it seems like you attract a lot of young people. But I, in general, would say that this is, this is a musical style, you know, this loud kind of, kind of guitar music that attracts a lot of young ones, you know. Some stick with it during their whole life, but it is especially a, a music for the younger generation. So that, that's what I always thought, you know. I don't listen to a lot of loud music these days. I, sometimes I throw in an old Judas Priest record or I listen to something where Ronnie James Dio was laying vocals on. Or I, I listen to Number of the Beast. That happens, but I'm not particularly interested in the metal scene. When it comes to, when it comes to music, I mainly listen to classical music, the whole time classical music. 
It's like that could it's be like inspiring too, but that could be inspiring for metal too, right? I mean, absolutely, yeah, 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 that's very true. That's very true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let me let me ask you about uh, in, on your first solo album, which I, I really do like. All right, you know, there, there was a contribution by Adrian Smith, right? Right. Have you kept that relationship with him? I mean, we've asked you about the Iron Maiden questions in the past. You know, <laughs> everybody has. But what about Adrian Smith? I mean, do you keep in touch? I with actually, him? I cuddled with him. I cuddled with him when we played, I think it was Rock and Mule. I think that was, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was sweet and it was all lovely, but I haven't had, haven't been in touch with him since. Just very briefly, shortly after that, uh, I just told him that I'm not going to do uh, another solo record soon or whatever. And then he was back into Maiden and then it's not interesting anymore anyway. You know, it's like, but uh, we, we, uh, we, we cuddled. It was it was nice when when I saw him after all these years. I mean, he's a very very sweet guy. He's just a just a very um, hard driven and straightforward person. I like him a lot. He's also my favorite guitar player in our name. Would you ever cons- did you ever have a talk saying you know what we should have a band together, just at least a project or anything like just other with, than- just just with the uh, um, Gas G, because mm. it, it was it was always this problem with Kai not getting his stuff together when we were uh, working with Unisonic. It was always on Dennis's shoulder and he had to do everything. And, and Kai, when we wanted to do the third Unisonic record, Kai was kind of swarmed with work for Gamma Ray. The record company wanted to re-release all the Gamma Ray stuff with extra tracks. And he wasn't really caring much about, about Unisonic. And there was no arguments or any, any negativity, but we sat together. We said, you know what? Why don't you just do that stuff with Gamma Ray? And we do a record with, with Gus G this time. And we, he was fine with it. You know, no problem. It was, not, it was not anyone being thrown out. It was just a realistic look at the situation. He just wasn't really in for it. And then we actually, uh, uh, Dennis started to write with Gus G. And they had some great ideas. And then Gus G kind of pulled out again. He was like, ah, I love Unisonic and I would love to do it, but I don't want to be, you know, that replacement guitarist mm. again, you know? So it didn't happen. And then he got out of Aussie. And of course the situation was different, but then I already started with Halloween. So he kind of missed that window where we could have made a third uh, Unisonic record, which would have been interesting. You know, Very especially interesting. With, with Gus G. I'm still regretting it. I'm sure he regrets it. He should have done it. <laughs> You know, he had he's a friend concerns. of the show. He's a friend of the show. You know, I'm sure he's going to watch guy. this. I understand his concerns. I understand his concerns. You know, you join a band. You don't want to be seen as a replacement guitarist, you know. But I think he should have done it because we would have done a, a sweet record, I'm sure. It would have been, would have been a great record. Well, since, since you and brought then, him up. When it didn't happen, you know, actually what happened was Kai stayed in the band and we finished with the last couple of shows with Kai. We had some great shows with Unisonic and then we did the, the Halloween reunion. And that's how it went down without a third record, you know, which is a bit of a shame. So so now that you brought up a few, that's one of my questions. All you have to say is this is a closed subject or still open. So we go back to visit, revisit some of your projects. Place Vendôme. A Place Vendôme I loved. It was always very easy. I always liked the material. I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I, I've always been a big David Coverdale fan. I just love his voice, you know, especially, I grew up with him, with White Snake and stuff. And it was great to meet him, actually, uh, when we jumped on the, on the tour in 2019. It was the same situation. It was a bit different because it happened because Dave Mustaine got sick. That's why Megadeth couldn't be on the Scorpions tour. And then they were Scorpions, White Snake, uh, White Snake, Scorpion, sorry. And so they asked us if we wanted to do it, and I'm glad we did it. I mean, otherwise we would not have played in 2019 at all. We were in the face of making the album, but since they offered us this thing, we thought, yeah, why not? Let's do it. So we jumped on the tour, and that was the last thing we did. So the last show we did before the pandemic was Rock and Rio, before I had made it. And it, like I, I always like to tell the story because it is such a funny story. How I how I actually got to talk to to David Coverdale, who's actually very sweet. He was like the opposite to what you would expect by the image. You know, he was very <laughs> down to earth, very natural, and very a, a sweetheart. I mean, it's all I can say. I was at the toilet on the, on the in the backstage area, <laughs> and there was no toilet paper, so I, I I didn't do my business. You know, I was just in there looking. Uh, is there any toilet paper? Because it's good to watch before you do that. Yes, right? always before. 
And I heard there was someone in the toilet too. So I was I was shouting, is there any toilet paper somewhere? And then that guy said, yeah, in some toilets it is, and others it isn't and stuff. So I just went out and it was covered. <laughs> You know, so I went. I went with a fist bump, and he returned that fist bump. Then we walked back to the to the dressing room and talked a little bit. And I thought it was funny that my first conversation with David Coverdale was about toilet paper. <laughs> and that was nice. That was nice. That was really good. I don't even know where that came from. <laughs> I mean, he was he was. They were always starting first, and and Unisonic was 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 supposed to get on second up before the Scorpions. And that's what we did every show. And it's like, the, so we, we were waiting, fully dressed and, and everything. And then the White Snake came off the stage and I was like very often fist bumping with him again. You know, it was, I was just very, very sweet for me. When you, when you admire someone, you know, when you grow up with someone and he turns out to be very okay, makes you happy. I mean, if he didn't hand you the toilet paper, then you would have had a completely different vision. He didn't of hand it. it to me. He just said that there's in some toilets it is, but it's like it's like we had that starting conversation, and uh, I'll never forget that. Amazing. Okay. So that, that's where your influence on the Plas Van Dome albums, I take it. Oh, that's how I came to it, right? Uh, Plas Van Dome, Plas Van Dome. I mean, when you're not in a band, uh, you do projects, you know. And and Plas Van Dome was great, but I don't I, I don't really think that I would continue that. I, th okay. I think the thing that I would be personally interested in is is another uh, is still the, that record with uh, Gus G, a Unisonic record with Gus G. Go. But but that's really up to Dennis because he is and has been the driving force behind it. Uh, I mean, there shouldn't be any doubt about it. He is the working horse behind it. He yeah. was writing most of the songs. He was producing it. Dennis is the light of Unisonic. It was him, and, and if he would be up for it, and the rest of the Halloween guys wouldn't be against it, which probably would be the case, because it's from the music, it's not far away enough from what we're doing. Right. That's probably not going to happen. But I personally would be open to something like that because I, I, like I that. thought, I thought Unisonic is is nothing to be ashamed of. You know, I think it, I think we did two pretty nice records. Okay. Or, or instead of Kiske Somerville, or some of another Kiske, thing, Gus G Kiske, Kiske G. Yeah, you know the, the thing. Well. Again, that would be kind of I don't know, being not. I, I would I would think the band wouldn't like me to do that. But some of those, it's a different story. Again, you know, it's it's singing duet with a girl, and the songs were very often almost folk like or had like an Irish touch to it. You know, it had a very different quality to it. Um, um, I don't know that. I mean, I love Amanda. I think she's amazing, and 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 a lot of people like that stuff. I mean, that's that's one of the things that I probably would be open to. But still, it would all be up to the to the management to agree with it, you know. Because now I'm exclusive with Halloween, so everything that I do, I of course I have to I have to sort it out with them, you know. So so if Toby from Avantasia calls, you're taking the call. I did. I did. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm not so much live. Uh, because it's getting too much, you know. I wouldn't, uh, that, I wouldn't survive that if I if I also tour with uh, with Avantasia now. But of course, I mean, if Toby calls, I si I sing the song. Because when we interviewed him, he said he's very happy with the core nucleus that he has, of which, of course, you're part of for forever. And uh, he's not looking to necessarily add any any new new people. So uh, I'm glad that yeah, uh, you was, could answer I that. Was for I was an Avantasian of the first hour. You know, I was yeah. I was on the first record. I mean, I didn't tour on the first tour, but I I was part of the second one and the third one. And yeah, Avantasia, like I always say that they will always have a piece in my heart, as you say. You know, Avantasia has been great, absolutely. Are there more Alan? Any more of those bands? Any projects? Well, that's they covered them all. That's all the projects that I came. What about I have done a whole bunch of stuff, but it's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, that's what you do when you're not in a band. But but now I'm in a band. I, I'm actually doing a solo record, which is plain acoustic music. You know, I I cover a whole bunch of songs that you wouldn't even believe that that I would do them. It's a completely different world. I'm doing a song of Billy Joel. I'm doing one police track. I do a song of U2. It is it's all just very simple on, on the acoustic guitar, you know, and and. and and I do stuff of my own. I have like, it's probably going to be half and half. I cannot tell you when that's done, but that's so off anything we do with Halloween. I think you spoke about that last time we spoke a year yeah. ago. So, very possibly. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
yeah. I stopped working on it. I stopped working on it at the end of 21 because somehow my energy was gone. I got into a fight with a person that I really love and that took away all the energy. And since then, I haven't picked it up. Ah, well, a little bit. I actually mixed a little bit yesterday. I was kind of fooling around with the, with the sound a bit. Mike, Michael, is it true that when you were first asked to be the singer of Halloween on the Walls of Jericho album, well, after the Walls of Jericho album, you didn't like it? Like you turned him down the first time around? Yeah. It was Marcus showed up at the rehearsal of my school band, which 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 I was the driving force in, like it often is. You know, it's like you have the, the driving forces of various bands and they come together and then they make a really good band. You know, it's like I was in my own school band and one day, Marcus showed up uh, pretty much the same way he is today. <laughs> it's the same kind of kind of attitude. And, and he, oh, you're a good boy singer. And our singer doesn't want to sing anymore. You know, he wants to concentrate on playing guitar and maybe he would like to do it. Somehow the, the rumors about me were kind of, you know, going around in, in, in Hamburg. And uh, I think Wikey was the one who was actually sending Marcus, you know, to check me out. And he gave me Walls of Jericho. He gave me Walls of Jericho. And it wasn't my cup of tea. I was, I'm not, I was never a thrash musician. I was into Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, Queensryche. I liked Metallica, the first three records. Um, but I didn't want to do that type of music. The music that I wanted to do was more in the vein of like Queensryche or Iron Maiden, you know, that sort of thing. Very melodic and and, and uh, musical and uh, the threshy part of uh, the walls of character wasn't my cup of tea. So I never called, I never called. I was just, I was just uh, not interested. But then a couple of weeks later, Wikey called me up. I was still living with my mother. I was in the bath actually. I was taking a bath when she was bringing me the phone. <laughs> and then Wikey was actually saying, yeah, I know walls of character was very punky. You know, we did that for fun, but we're looking for someone like you to do something completely different. Why don't you show up at the rehearsal room and we show you the songs that we have written for your voice. And I got to the, to the, to the rehearsal room and they had already songs like Twilight of the Gods. I, I even think Future World and March of Time. And there were elements from Wikey had elements already from Keeper. And I was doing that stuff and, and that was it. And we didn't even talk about it. We didn't even <laughs> say it was never mentioned. You are in the band now. I was there and it was clear. We just did it. And that was it. <laughs> it was funny. I, I recognized that later. There was never a moment where anyone said you were in the band. It was, it was just, it just happened. Fine singer. Check. <laughs> <laughs> what but why he talked me into it by by his vision you know saying we want to do more than that you know and for that we need a singer like you and that's how it came together like he's this he is a visionary he you know he's a great he's an excellent oh, yeah. interview too he's he's a great uh, he's got great he doesn't, he doesn't live on planet earth <laughs> yeah he doesn't live on planet earth but that has benefits is he still know? chain smoking that's what i want to know the thing with him is he's so much in his own world so that, that everything he does is different, you know? Everything he does, his thinking is different. You can you can sit together with the band and something happens. And then he says something where you're like, what? Has, only in his head, something like this has happened right now. He sees yes. everything in a completely different way, which is interesting. You know, he's a very unique person. I mean, this at least he, <laughs> he told say, us He told us that the band after, I don't know if it was, I guess it was Chameleon, it was like in a, Two million Deutschmark debt. Is that what it was? Or something? Yeah, almost, yeah. We were like completely fucked by the record company. It was, it was, it was, it was actually off to keep it too. Oh. When we, when we realized that the, how shitty the contracts were, you know, and, uh, and in addition to 80% record company, 20% band, we also had to pay all the costs from the 20%. Oh. So it's like, so it's like when you, tour on the level we toured we sold out like we had like successful tours we sold millions of records and lost money that's the reason why we knew something must be wrong i mean they cheated on us so stupidly we had to realize it and even then you know rod smallwood was actually trying to help us he was like getting to the band he was he was uh, using the, the lawyers from emi records in england but he was kind of miscalculating 
the German law, because the German law in those days, I don't know if it's different today, but in those days, they didn't know what was going on in the business. They had no experience with these sort of ways of cheating on musicians. In England, they knew. If we would have so been in England, we would have won right away. Over here, he was even able to injunct it. They didn't even look at the numbers. We could prove where he was kind of, you know, Baltabach, who he was kind of cheating with the numbers. They didn't even look at it. And that was the situation. They kind of over judged the capabilities of the of the German courts when it comes to how musicians get screwed. So yes, we ended up with lots of money in the debts because of because of the way we had been cheated. Yeah. But it doesn't only happen, it happened, doesn't only happen to us, it happened to so many bands. Another band is the Scorpions. They had the same crap in the whole oh. 70s. After they, they, they first started to make some money after uh, uh, Blackout. A, uh, Still, uh, later. Oh, no, Winds of change. change. Yeah. Change. That was oh my they, God. Because they had been screwed by pretty much the same kind of people. I talked even to Klaus Mein about this in the 80s, when, uh, in the late 80s when it happened. And another example is Aerosmith. They didn't make anything until the beginning of the 80s, selling millions of records, setting out stadiums, arenas, you know. And uh, um, Steven Tyler was sleeping on the couch in New York at RCA because, because there was no more money, you know. It's like, Ugh. but after that, they, they got smarter and they, they figured it out. Like us, where we learned a lot and now everything is a lot better. So good, good. our time's almost up. I just want to go this Canadian tour. It's basically Toronto. We're disappointed to just see it's one date. What, <laughs> what's the logistics? How hard is it to travel to a different country in North America? The North America thing is going to be especially difficult for me because I don't sleep in buses. And somehow they actually made that tour with a nightliner, which I will I will be flying wherever it's possible, but I don't sleep in nightliner. So th that that will add to the to the stress, you know. But I uh, I will try, try to mentally adjust to it. It's it's going to be a little bit over three weeks there where I will not get a lot of sleep. Um, it's you know we we tried to play North America for the first time with this Halloween concert in 2018. We only did maybe about five shows, four or five shows. And it went down really well. It was really nice. It's like everywhere we played, it was sold out. And the audience was amazing. So we took that and, and this time we try to make it a little bigger, a little more places. You, we just see where we get with this. And from there, we see what we do next. You know, that's just the way you do it. But it was very successful 2018 when we were there. It was really good. So we just thought we'd try it again this time. But it's going to be tough on the ones who can't sleep in the bus, like me. Mm -hmm. I can't either if, if that makes you feel any better um, horrible. horrible all right so it's there horrible. we go thank you so much Michael we could talk to you for like three hours straight uh, Halloween going on tour in North America and of course in South America in April and in May in the US and one date in Canada but it's okay we'll see you the next time around it's all good yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Canada, Canada I think did we play in Canada you played in Montreal I was there yes, we played yeah 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 right yes exactly. you played in Montreal yeah yeah, I, I don't know what the market is there like for bands. Right? I, I met you at the hotel. I met right, you at the right. hotel. Yeah, I remember in your face. I remember your face. I actually do. I got a very not, Robert De Niro yeah. remembered face. Robert De Niro. <laughs> I'm not good with names. I, I, I hardly remember my own, but I'm good with faces. <laughs> Michael, Michael, and the conversation went like this. I go, Michael, I'm not going to shake your hands because I have a cold. And then you just cut uh, it <laughs> That's the Antichrist. That's the Antichrist. Oh, but it's okay. You were very polite, and you, from a distance, you were very polite, and everything went well. <laughs> this is like the worst. If you on tour, getting sick. That's why I'm so excited. I and mean, we all had Corona like last year in the summer. Everybody had it. We like like everybody in the band, including the management, had it. Vaccinated or not, didn't make any difference. But it's like it's like uh, we all had it when the when the short tour was was over and then we had like like over three months of a break so we could like recover and then we've been touring for about something like six weeks or something like over europe like the the, the um uh, like the, the whole area of europe and south america and i'm we, we were meeting people like hundreds of people every day nobody was wearing protection there was no mouth protection anything i'm 100 percent sure we got in contact with the virus but it nothing happened mm. it seems like it seems like we were once you got it you kind of 
probably yeah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. I agree. On that note, thank you so much, Michael. Looking forward to seeing you in in in, in person. Uh, sorry, at the show again, as well as next time on an interview. Uh, it's always a pleasure. And yeah, my pleasure. Success, and we can't wait to hear some new music too. Yeah. All right, man. Thank All you. the best. For-